you um, might be laboring stark ass naked. I, can I say that? Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. It has been a while since I have posted. If you are new here, my name is Elizabeth. I'm a labor and delivery nurse, postpartum nurse, certified childbirth educator, and mom to three. And today I wanted to come with a video for you guys, kind of an easy adjustment back into my weekly posting that I'm hoping to do now that all of my kids are giving me a few hours of being in school for the school year. And that is with a meme reaction video. So memes are one of my favorite things on the internet, particularly when they pertain to nursing and childbirth and all those good things. I have compiled some really fabulous memes, some of which you guys have sent me over on my Instagram, which I'm much more active on than this channel, or at least I have been if you wanna follow me over there. I wanted to go ahead and react to these. Now, there are a lot of labor and delivery nurse memes that are mean-spirited, but we don't take that kind of negativity on this channel here. So we are just gonna do some laughing and some educating and combine the two together. So if you wanna see that, definitely stick around and let's go ahead and jump into it. Okay, I'm gonna start off with one that I really, really like. It's the guy from Dawson's Creek crying and it says, what happens in the delivery room stays in the delivery room. And this is 100% true. I often tell people that this is a place that's like Vegas. What happens here stays here. And there's a reason for that. And I'm gonna break it down for you. So when we are in labor, when we are laboring and we are jiving and vibing and doing our thing, we are not in our frontal cortex. We are not in our neocortex, right? All of our higher level thinking, all of our politeness and our manners and our inhibitions that are up there, we don't wanna be in that part of our brain because when we're birthing, we're most like the mammals that are surrounding us in nature and we need to be thinking with that part of our brain. It's that part of our brain where our hypothalamus and our pituitary gland are that are releasing the oxytocin and the other hormones that are going to facilitate labor. And so if we get out of that higher level thinking, if we stop worrying about what people think about us and can tap into our mammalian brain, you um, might be laboring stark ass naked. I, can I say that? You might be laboring stark naked and that's okay. You might be making noises that you did not even realize could come out of your own body and that is okay. You might, you know, while you're pushing poop and that, what is it? Okay. All of these things are okay. If you tell me to stop and don't add a please to it, then I'm kind of like she is in her mammalian brain, which is where she needs to be. It's okay if you're not polite. It's okay if you're indecent. Now, if you want to wear clothes and keep clothes on the whole time, that's okay too. But this is a place similar to Vegas. What happens here stays here. No judgment from your labor team at all. Promise. And then we can just pretend like none of that happened if you don't want to tell people later. So the next few that I have are all about epidurals. This one is like a little shrimp. It looks like maybe it's from SpongeBob and it's like the position that you need to be in when you get an epidural. 100% true. So this is a meme of something that is what I tell my patients. So when we are getting in position for an epidural, often you're gonna be sitting up on the edge of the bed with your knees all the way back and then you wanna curl your back almost like a scared cat or a shrimp. And really what we wanna focus on is that this lower part of the back is totally poked out. And if you do that, right, if you curl around your baby bump that you've got in front of you right now and feel in between your vertebrae, you can feel that we create more space when we round out that lower part of our back. That is really easy to do when you're not pregnant and not in pain. But if you are pregnant and you are in pain, it can be a little bit more challenging. So your nurse and your anesthesiologist are gonna work with you to get into that really good position. But being in that really good position is gonna give them access to your back so that they can very quickly get in that epidural. One thing that you can practice during your pregnancy is some cat-cow positions. Five to 10 minutes of just practicing your breathing in some cat-cows can definitely help gets you prepared to getting in that similar position while seated to push out that lower part of your back. You're gonna let those shoulders drop, just have the worst posture ever, curl around and push out your lower back like a little shrimp, like a scared cat, and the epidural hopefully will slide right in because this next one really got me because it's so true. Okay. How to expect anesthesia to respond when I call for an epidural placement? And then it says, on my way, and it is a picture of Forrest Gump running at full speed. When you ask for an epidural, you want it this moment. 
for most people. And something to keep in mind, depending on the acuity of your hospital, depending on if anesthesia is in-house, depending on there's more people laboring, depending on a lot of things, it can take sometimes up to an hour from asking for an epidural for you to have one in and for you to feel comfortable. So it's really important that when you ask for an epidural, you have that in mind, right? That it can take a little bit of time. If you're thinking that you want one, definitely letting your nurse know well before you want one so that she can make sure that anesthesia knows. And then also continuing to work with our labor toolbox to get through this little bit of time until we get our epidural because there is going to be some steps that we have to kind of go through before we get in our epidural. So if you're just arriving and off the street and you want an epidural, you do need to have an IV and labs drawn. They're gonna check your platelets to make sure that those aren't too low. If those are under 90 to 100, then an epidural might not be something that is offered to you because there is a concern of having bleeding after the epidural. Now, the other things that they might have you do once you want an epidural is empty your bladder, and then they're going to hook you up to an IV, and they might want you to get a full bag or half a bag of IV fluid before the placement of the epidural. And this does two things. One, it's going to help bolster up that epidural space, make it a little bit more plump and juicy for them to get into. But more importantly, what it does is it helps when all of our blood vessels get nice and relaxed from that epidural. <sighs> what tends to happen is that our blood pressure also goes down. And when our blood pressure goes down, it can make us feel oozy woozy, tunnel vision, like we're gonna pass out, it also means that our placenta is getting less blood flow. And if our placenta is getting less blood flow, then our baby is getting less blood flow. So that can lead to decelerations in the heart rate or issues there that we want to kind of stave off before they happen. Now, even with getting fluid, sometimes our blood pressure will drop. Your nurse, your anesthesiologist are going to be watching your blood pressure pretty consistently after you get an epidural. You're gonna have a blood pressure cuff on your arm probably until you deliver your baby. And so when we are watching that blood pressure, we are just making sure that it's not getting low. And if it does, then we can treat you with ephedrine or phenylephrine, which are two IV medications that they can give to bring the blood pressure back up. But all of those things are gonna happen before the anesthesiologist even gets in the room. Then your anesthesiologists, obviously we've called them, they might be coming from home, they might be working on other cases in the hospital, or they might have a few other people ahead of you who want epidurals. So we are just gonna be coping and vibing and doing our best to maintain relaxation, rhythm, and ritual to decrease tension, decrease fear, decrease pain all of these things until we're able to get the epidural. Know that you still need to be getting through those contractions until you get your epidural. Because even once it's placed, it doesn't work instantaneously. It is gonna start at your toes and work its way up to your belly. So you might first notice that your legs feel a little heavy or tingly until it gets up to your belly. Then you might notice that the contractions start to feel a little bit shorter and what really is happening is you're just feeling the peak until it fully covers. Now, we might still feel pressure, we might still feel tightening, but we should not feel pain with an epidural. And if we are, then we have to troubleshoot from there. But just know, yes, we want them to run to us as fast as they can, and even if they do, it still might take a little bit of time for you to get fully comfortable. Okay, here is one. It is a little mouse who gets disturbed, and it says, waking my patient up to reposition. Now, you, Let's just say you've gotten your epidural and it's lovely and glorious and you're finally getting a nap. I love that for you. And ideally though, with that epidural, we're changing positions every 30 to 45 minutes. I know, I know. And it's really hard if it's the middle of the night or if you've been laboring and laboring and laboring. So we definitely can have a conversation of like, hey, I would like to just hang tight for about an hour and just get a nap. I love that for you, let's do that. But then we need to get moving. And why are we moving? First and foremost, we're moving because if you didn't have an epidural, you would be moving. And your movement is magical, right? We know that when we move, when we reposition, it can change the shape of our pelvis. It can move our tailbone out of the way. It can allow for your baby to navigate through your pelvis to dilate your cervix and to come down into the birth canal so that it's time and ready for you to push. So we have to be moving to facilitate this. If we simply let you lie on your back or sit up just a little bit, but on your back, your 
baby's heaviest part is going to go to gravity or it has the potential to go to gravity and turn them so that they are facing up, which is a much more difficult position for them to come down, dilate your cervix, and then ultimately for you to push out. So that is why we are moving and we are grooving. Now, it might be a slight position change. Maybe we've got the peanut ball on your side and then we do more of a tilt, but a lot of times I am flipping you in like your little rotisserie chicken. So we're on one side, we're on the other side. We're maybe sitting up and thrown for 30 minutes. We are on hands and knees because yes, you can get on hands and knees with an epidural as long as you are able to move those legs still and you have some movement and some feeling in those legs, which a lot of people do with epidurals. We are doing like an exaggerated sideline position where you are almost all the way over on your belly. We are moving and grooving and shaking things up based on where your baby is in your pelvis to open that place and allow baby to come down and to rotate and to flex their little noggin. This is the part of labor and delivery that is like a little puzzle that I get to figure out that I actually really enjoy doing because when we are able to help you move into these positions and your baby then is able to rotate and come down, it's like this magic solution that we figured out. Because the body really is made to do this. You were made to birth your babies. And with an epidural, we just have to continue to enhance those natural movements and reflexes that you would do in response to your baby moving in your pelvis. You would change positions, you would move your body, and so we're just helping you to do that when you have an epidural. Okay, this next one, I have felt this very really quite recently. After pushing with a Primip, three and a half hours later, everything hurts and I'm dying. So Primip is somebody who's having their first baby. And we know that the average length of pushing for your first baby is about two hours. And that we can push sometimes for up to like four hours and it can be really exhausting because just like I said, we had to change position every 30 minutes or so in labor with an epidural. We wanna be changing positions about every 15 minutes when we're pushing. And when you're pushing, most of the time, it is your nurse who is in there with you the whole time and your doctor's kind of coming in and out. We are helping you figure out how to push, figure out different positions, figure out exactly what to do. And we are helping you get your baby out and then what you are doing and what takes along particularly with your first baby is that these soft tissues these muscles have to kind of move and adapt to your baby's little noggin your baby's head is going to be shaped and molded by the soft tissues and by the shape of your pelvis and then your pelvis actually is like about a 90 degree angle that your baby has to get underneath and so we can help facilitate this by helping you push in upright birthing positions so squatting hands and knees you can sit up in like a throne position and push in that position do like a tug of for pulling, we can be pushing on our side. All of these things help open up your pelvis and move things around and help baby not have to work against gravity to get through that 90 degree angle. So it can be a workout for you, it can be a workout for me. And I have found, and I have heard a lot of labor nurses say this too, when you're bearing down, I'm bearing down a little bit too, which I'm sorry, Dr. Little is so bad for my pelvic floor. I need to not do this. I'm, I, I'm really trying to work on not pushing and breathing, making sure that I am breathing when my patients are pushing so that I am not bearing down as well because not great for those hemorrhoids that we have already uh, spoken about in this video. Whew, getting a little TMI here. But yes, sometimes it takes a really long time and that is okay. So it's important that you are taking some sips of water, having a little bit of sugar. Maybe even we pause and we have a little snack because spoiler alert, eating in labor is not the be all end all that it seems to have been and the research supports eating in labor. Um, but that's a subject for another video. But yes, so know that sometimes it takes a little bit of time and that is okay. Oh my gosh, I feel this one so hard. So this is a picture and it says Kate Middleton after giving birth and then me after giving birth and Kate Middleton looks beautiful and she's holding her baby. She's wearing a red dress, which is very apropos because she is bleeding and is posing for the paparazzi in the, the magazines. And then a picture of Rocky, who's just been punched in the face and it says me after giving birth. So 
both of these are variations of normal. Like most of us aren't going to have a professional come in and do our hair and makeup and get us ready to take pictures. But some people after giving birth, they do it and it's like nothing even happened. And some people, they have been through the ringer. And I think just knowing that that is okay if you're one of those people who literally feels like your entire body has been beat up on is normal, right? I would say the Kate Middleton version is, is, is more of the rarity and the... Stallone is more of the what we would expect so just know like you might feel like that what do we need to think about maybe you don't want visitors to come see you in the hospital or at least you want them to wait until you're on postpartum and you've had a chance to have a nap right because you might feel just utterly exhausted and you're going to be riding on a little bit of a high after your baby's born you've had a burst of adrenaline that helps you get that last little bit of pushing done helps your baby take its first breaths and sometimes you're kind of riding on that for a little bit until that goes down and then you just are really feeling sore so i recommend you know ice on and off if you have a sore perineum, a sitz bath in the next couple of days after that can feel absolutely fabulous using your witch hazel, using your numbing spray, all of those for down there. But even more people don't realize like, oh my gosh, my arms hurt from like doing tug of war or my neck and my shoulders hurt. Having a massage postpartum, if you are able to sneak away from your baby or better yet, if you have somebody who would come to your house and give you a massage, can be so absolutely amazing. After all of my births, I had the ability probably at about a month. So it was a little while, but I was able to go and get a massage and it was just perfect and exactly what I needed because my muscles and my body were sore from this amazing workout that I just did to birth a baby. So with all that being said, I want to thank you guys so much for watching. Definitely if you have any other memes, you can send them to me over on Instagram. Let me know if you learned anything. Let me know what videos you might want to see from me. I have a shoulder dystocia video coming. I also have a birth plan video coming and so many more ideas that I want to get out for you guys because I love educating and I love hopefully helping you guys feel more confident in your births. So until next time, bye guys.